Section 17 of The Magic of the Horseshoe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence The Luck of Odd Numbers Part 2 Part 5 Odd Numbers in Folk Medicine In a volume containing a great variety of ancient charms and magical cures collected by Marcellus Empiricus, a Latin writer of the 4th century AD, in which volume various remedial measures are described with great minuteness. The even numbers seldom appear. Thus, for the removal of a foreign substance from the eye, one should rub the affected organ with the five fingers of the hand of the same side and repeat thrice a charm of words again for the cure of a sty on the eyelid take nine grains of barley and poke the sty with each one separately meanwhile repeating a magic formula in greek then throw away the nine and do the same with seven throw away the seven and do the same with five, and so with three and one. The early Saxon physicians in England seem also to have had faith in the peculiar virtues of the number nine, as is evident from many of their prescriptions, of which the following prefix to a lengthy Latin charm is a fair specimen. For flying venom, and every venomous swelling, on a Friday, churn butter which has been milked from a neat or hind all of one color and let it not be mingled with water sing over it nine times a litany and nine times the pater noster and nine times this incantation in an ancient english manuscript harleian collection number 585 Frequent examples are given of the employment of odd numbers in therapeutics. Thus, for dropsical affections, a beverage containing alexander, betony, and fennel is to be drunk daily for seven days. To expel venom, centauri is to be taken for fifteen days, and a potion prepared from the seed of cress is extolled for its curative qualities if taken faithfully during three days indeed the odd numbers are prominent in the annals of folk medicine throughout great britain the three chief duties of a physician were declared to be as follows the restoration of health when lost its amelioration when weak and its preservation when recovered so also three qualities were requisite in a surgeon namely an eagle's eye a lion's heart, and a lady's hand, attributes equally essential to the skillful operator of the present day. The natives of the Hebrides inherit the old Scandinavian and Celtic partiality for certain odd numbers. Thus, in Thierry, a favorite cure for jaundice consists in wearing a shirt previously dipped in water taken from the tops of nine waves, and in which nine stones have been boiled these same people formerly employed a peculiar method of treating sick cattle the veterinary holding in his hands a cup of cream and an oat cake takes his seat upon the animal and repeats a celtic charm of words nine times nine times taking a bit and a sip before each repetition in cornwall for the cure of inflammatory affections, the invocation of three angels is thrice repeated to each one of nine bramble leaves, and a popular remedy for whooping cough is to pass a child nine times under and over a three-year-old donkey. In the south of England, for intermittent fever, the patient is recommended to eat seven sage leaves on seven successive mornings fasting meanwhile and in northern scotland scrofulous affections are thought to yield to the touch of a seventh sun when accompanied 
by an invocation of the Trinity. The belief in the magical curative qualities of the number nine was not limited to the northern nations. Thus, the inhabitant of ancient Apulia, when bitten by a scorpion, proceeded to walk nine times around the walls of his native town. Dr. D. G. Brinton, in his Nagualism, a study of Native American folklore and history, remarks that the number nine recurs very often in the conjurations of Mexican magicians. The women of Canton, China, attribute magical properties for the cure of cutaneous affections to water drawn after midnight of the seventh day of the seventh month. When a gypsy child bumps its head, a knife blade is first pressed upon the swelling, after which an incantation is pronounced three, seven, or nine times, and the knife is stuck into the earth a like number of times. Many charms employed by gypsies could be mentioned in illustration of the avoidance of even numbers in all their mystic rites. Part 6. The Number 13. In regard to the luck of odd numbers, the exception, which is commonly supposed to prove the rule, is the much maligned 13. In the Scandinavian mythology, Loki, the principle of evil, and the chief author of human misfortunes, accompanied the twelve Aesir, or demigods, and was reckoned the thirteenth among them. Moreover, the Valkyrs, or virgins, who waited upon the heroes in Valhalla, were thirteen in number, and from these sources is believed to have sprung the very common superstition concerning the ill luck and fatality of the number thirteen especially in connection with a party of guests at table. The most generally received explanation of the origin of this popular belief refers it to the Last Supper of our Lord, where Judas is sometimes represented as the thirteenth guest. But why Judas, rather than John, the beloved disciple? However, this is the generally accepted starting point of this notable superstition. As with the Jews, the thirteenth month, and with the Christians the thirteenth day of the year, which began with Christmas, were accounted ominous. So, with the inhabitants of India, the thirteenth year was considered to be of evil import. It is evident, therefore, that the source of this nearly worldwide belief cannot be attributed wholly either to the mythology of the North or to the Paschal Supper. When the year was reckoned as 13 lunar months of 28 days each, the number 13, according to one view, was considered auspicious. But when under the present method of solar time, the number of months was reduced to 12, 13's reputation was changed for the worse. In early times, the Feast of the Epiphany, which is the 13th day after Christmas Eve, was feared because at that time the three goddesses, Berkta, Holly, and Bifana, with their ghostly companions, were especially active. And as a guard against their machinations, the initial letters of the names of the three kings or wise men were written on many a door. Of the former trio, Berkta was represented as a shaggy monster, whose name was used as a bugbear with which to frighten children. She was entrusted with the oversight of spinning and on the eve of Epiphany, she visited the homes of the country folk, distributing empty reels, which she required to be filled within a specified time. If her demands were not complied with, she retaliated by tangling and befouling the flax. Holly, or Holda, was a benignant and merciful goddess of an obliging disposition, who was usually most lenient Except when she noticed disorder in the affairs of a household, her favorite resorts were the lakes and fountains, but she had also an oversight over domestic concerns, and shared with Berkta the supervision of spinning. Sometimes, however, she appeared as an old hag with bristling matted hair and long teeth. Bifana, the third goddess, was of Italian origin, and her name signifies epiphany 
on that day the women and children used to place a rag doll in the window in her honor in personal appearance she was black and ugly but her disposition was not unfriendly so universal has been the superstition regarding the number thirteen at table that it has long been a matter of etiquette in france to avoid having exactly that number of guests at dinner parties the parisian picassiette a person whose title corresponds to the english trencher friend or sponger is also known as a quatorisem his chief mission being to occupy the fourteenth seat at a banquet the ancients we learn had ideas of their own regarding the proper size of festive gatherings their favorite number of convives being between three and nine the number of the graces and muses respectively opinions have differed as to whether misfortune were likely to befall the whole company of thirteen persons rash enough to dine together or only the one leaving the room first after the repast all evil however was supposed to be averted by the entire company rising to their feet together it has been wittily remarked that the only occasion when thirteen plates at table should cause disquietude is when the food is only sufficient for twelve persons at the thirteenth annual dinner of that unique organization the thirteen club held in new york city january thirteenth eighteen ninety five at seven thirteen o'clock p m the custodian delivered an address in which were recounted the circumstances of the club's formation so prevalent was the apprehension of evil likely to result from the assembling together of thirteen persons that when at length the requisite number were seated at table it was found desirable to lock the doors of the banquet room lest some faint soul should retire abruptly field marshal lord roberts in his forty one years in india volume one page twenty four mentions a circumstance occurring in his own experience which affords evidence were any needed of the falsity of the superstition in question on new year's day a d eighteen fifty three lord roberts was one of a party of thirteen who dined together at a staff officer's mess at peshawar on the afghan frontier eleven years later all these officers were alive the greater number having participated in the suppression of the great sepoy mutiny of eighteen fifty seven during which several of them were wounded in italy shrewd theatrical managers have found it expedient to change the number of box thirteen to twelve a and in many streets of rome and florence one may search in vain for house numbers between twelve and a half and fourteen a gentleman of the writer's acquaintance living in washington d c sent a formal petition to the authorities asking leave to change the number of his house for the sole reason that it contained the ominous figures as an illustration of the popular distrust of the number thirteen among the villagers of the department of Vilaine, france may be cited the following custom which is in vogue in that district children are there usually taught the art of knitting by devout elderly women the little ones are first seated in a circle and to facilitate the work on the completion of the first round of knitting they are made to repeat the following words one the father at the close of the second round two the son and so on as follows three the holy spirit the four evangelists the five wounds of our lord the six commandments of the church seven sacraments eight beatitudes nine choirs of angels ten commandments of god eleven thousand virgins twelve apostles and at the close of the thirteenth round the children mention the name of judas this remarkable and unreasonable prejudice against an innocent number seems to pervade all classes and communities the possession of intelligence and culture is no effective barrier against it arguments and reasoning are alike vain even at this writing an evening journal records 
that at a recent meeting of a newly elected board of aldermen in an enlightened city of eastern Massachusetts, one of the members objected to casting lots for seats because he did not relish the idea of drawing number 13. However, his scruples having been in a measure overcome, he was much relieved to find that the number 11, which is both uneven and lucky, had fallen to his share. Brand quotes as follows from Fuller's Mixed Contemplations, 1660, in reference to this subject. A covetous courtier complained to King Edward the Sixth of Christ College in Cambridge that it was a superstitious foundation, consisting of a master and twelve fellows in imitation of Christ and his twelve apostles. He advised the king also to take away one or two fellowships so as to discompose the superstitious number. Oh no, said the king, I have a better way than that to mar their conceit. I will add a thirteenth fellowship unto them, which he did accordingly, and so it remaineth unto this day. Persians regard the number thirteen as so unlucky that they refrain from naming it. When they wish to allude to this number, instead of mentioning the proper term, they use words meaning much more or nothing. The Moors or Arabs of northern Africa have similar prejudices, whereas the American Negro, ordinarily a most credulous being, appears to be quite indifferent to the evil influences of the fateful number. But in Turkey, so great is the popular dislike of it that the word for thirteen is seldom used. In Scotland, this number is known as the Dale's Dozen, a phrase which has been supposed to have some connection with card playing, there being thirteen cards in each suit of the Dale's books. John Jamieson, in his Scottish Dictionary, avows his inability to trace the superstition to its source, but believes that it includes the idea of the thirteenth being the devil's lot. The number thirteen is also sometimes known as a baker's dozen, because it was formerly a common practice to give thirteen loaves for twelve, the extra piece being called the inbred or two-bread. This custom is supposed to have originated at a time when heavy fines were imposed for short weights, the additional bread being given by bakers as a precautionary measure. In certain cases, contrary to the general rule, thirteen is accounted a fortunate numeral, or even as one possessing extraordinary virtues. Dr. Daniel G. Brinton, in A Primer of Mayan Hieroglyphics, page 25, says that in the old language of the Mayas, an aboriginal tribe of Yucatan, the numbers 9 and 13 were used to denote indefinite greatness and supreme excellence. Thus, a very fortunate man was possessed of nine souls, and the phrase, 13 generations old, conveyed the idea of perpetuity. The demon with 13 powers was a prominent figure in the mythology of the Tentals, a Mayan tribe. According to a widely prevalent popular impression, a brood is usually odd in number, and therefore it is folly to set an even number of eggs under a hen. In spite of the falsity of this idea, it is still quite customary to set 13 eggs, an even number in this case being accounted unlucky. Gerald Massey, in The Natural Genesis, remarks that there were 13 kinds of spices set out in the Jewish religious service, along with the zodiacal number of 12 loaves of shoe bread. There are 13 articles to the Hebrew faith, and the Kabbalists have thirteen rules by which they are enabled to penetrate the mysteries of the Hebrew scriptures. Thirteen are the dialectical canons of the Talmudical doctors for determining the sense of the law in all civil and ecclesiastical cases. In England, the day of twenty-four hours was formerly divided into thirteen parts, as follows. One after midnight. Two cock crow. 
3. Between the first cockcrow and daybreak. 4. The dawn. 5. Morning. 6. Noon. 7. Afternoon. 8. Sunset. 9. Twilight. 10. Evening. 11. Candle time. 12. Bedtime. 13. Dead of night. Recurring now to the prevalent notions regarding the sinister and portentous character of this number, one may well inquire in all seriousness whether the harboring of this and other firmly rooted superstitious fancies is compatible with a deep and abiding Christian faith. The answer is plainly in the negative, therefore it is doubtless true, and the truth should make us free that the greater our indifference to the various alleged omens and auguries which so easily beset us, the more readily shall we acquire and retain a firm and enduring dependence on divine providence. End of section 17 End of The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence